Good evening. Hopefully you are all doing well. <clears throat> I know I am. Um, hopefully everyone got a chance to go outside today. It was actually a beautiful day today. Um, it's been a great fall and you know, we've had a really nice, uh, right? I mean, it, it, it wasn't so great in October for October, but November has been brilliant, I believe. And uh, hopefully it lasts, although I don't believe that it will. They might be wrong. It's it's not like the weatherman hasn't been wrong before. In fact, uh, they make a habit of being wrong. Um, actually, I need to clean my glasses. Here, hang on a second. So, uh, all right. So today we're going to move on. We're going to talk a little bit about architectures, and we're going to do it from kind of a high level. <clears throat> and there's different styles of ways to do things, although we're going to talk about an old way and a new way. Although we shouldn't say old way because the old way is still being used today, uh, and in fact that's mostly what we study. Um, we're going to talk about why that is. Uh, and so, and I've made some statements in the past that I didn't really explain very well. So I'm going to come back around to a few of those and actually explain them in a little bit more detail and explain why that is what I said, not just dictate to you. So understand that's an important an important part of uh, of learning and 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 doing what. What we are what we're doing here in computer science, in that really we shouldn't ever take anything for granted. Most of the time, I mean, sometimes when we're learning something, we have to take things for granted, but then we can come back and we can always dig deeper to see why that is. And and they say that every time you ask answer a question, every time you answer a question. You create two more. And in fact, this is actually true, right? Because if I give you an answer, right, one plus one is two, then you can always ask the question, well, why is that? Why do we do that the way we do it? And I can't answer that question, but there's possibility that in some kind of a foundational part of mathematics, you might be able to figure that out. Maybe some of you actually know why one plus one is two. I have a sense that it's just an identity, and there's nothing we can do about it. Um, we can certainly say, actually, we can certainly say in computer science that 2 plus 2 is not equal, always not equal to 4. Actually, that's a good one. So, in computer science, 2 plus is equal to, well, I suppose that's still read 4, but it looks different, doesn't it? Well, that's because I'm dealing in binary numbers here. I could say 1 plus 1 is not equal to 2, and cross that out, because it would be equal to 1, 0, isn't it? So some of that is about context, but that's a different story. Okay, I kind of went off on a tangent. I did that right away this time. Well, we got that out of the way. Now we can get down to business. Uh, uh, actually, you know, no, I'll leave that be. I'll, I, I, we don't need to, to leave that for posterity because it's really not what we're what we're doing for this class. Okay, so uh, actually what I've got today, we'll see how it goes, but it probably won't be the full uh, 80 minutes, uh, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. And uh, I have not gotten a chance to grade seven, uh, but I will be doing that uh, before I sleep tonight. So uh, assignment seven. So you'll have that. Um, I had somebody who asked me a question on that. And so I want to make sure that that's out there so you can get that feedback before uh, it's... I, 
I've got it ready to go, so it should be pretty, I should be able to get it done fairly quickly. But one of the things, at least to point out here, is that uh, the questions looked intimidating, right? Because there was a lot of words there. But if you're able to pull the data out of them, actually the problems weren't terribly hard to solve, right? We could go to basically one uh, or, or two, actually two lectures um, and be able to pull that information out. And that was all from chapter six, which is kind of a while ago now. So I know we're kind of lagging behind in the assignments and uh, we'll probably, I'll look to do about four more, um, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Maybe I'll combine a couple of the chapters. We'll, we'll see um, how, it, how it goes when, I, when I'm looking at creating these assignments. So, and then we'll do the programming assignments to kind of round things out. I'll have to look at the schedule too. All right, so uh, we're going to look at his architectures. And we're not talking about like columns and pillars and, and walls and crenelons or any of that kind of stuff, right? That's not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about architecture here. When I talk about architecture, what I'm talking about is how things are internally in designing them. And so primarily what we're going to look at today is ISAs. And we're going to look at two categories of the ISA. So first let me define what ISA is. If that's instruction. Set architecture. So what that means is how we decide which instructions to include and which ones not to include. One of the statements I made earlier, we'll come back to it. I know I made it earlier in the semester was in that inside of the processor, we don't have a multiplication. But then we probably looked and we saw, oh, well, we maybe we do have a multiplication. And we'll talk about the difference between having multiplication and not having multiplication. So the first thing, though, I want to do is, before talking about the different styles, we, I want to talk about how to determine how fast a program is. So let me let me let me draw a line here. And what I want to do is I want to get how long a program takes. So but we don't know, right? Somebody could tell us, right? But we need to be able to figure it out ourselves. Well, how do we do this? Okay. So, well, we think about it and we say, okay, do we have any kind of timing? And the answer is yes. We know how long a clock cycle is, right? Okay. So we have this thing called time per cycle. That's short for clock cycle. What else do we have? We also have how many instructions. Oh, oh, that's an N to start with. So instructions per program, right? And when we're working in assembly, what we mean by that is basically how many well, it's not exactly. Hmm. So, it's how many different total instructions will be executed for the program. Right? So, if I said, so if I create a loop, it's going to loop five times. Then all of the things inside that loop, say there's two things inside that loop, will be done five times each. Right, so then it'll be 10. So that's 10 instructions. And maybe I have three at the beginning and two at the end. So now I've got 20 total instructions. 
20, no, 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 I'm sorry, 15, right? Because there's three in front, two on the bottom, so five outside, and then five times through the loop, and there's two instructions inside the loop. That's, so that would be 10 inside the loop total, and then plus three and two is 15. So we can measure how many instructions there are per program. So then, well, if you're familiar with units and with uh, and or with with some of the different mathematical stuff here, we need to cross things off because we want the time to be on top and program to be on bottom. Ah, but we've got let me grab blue. We've got program here, so that's on the bottom. We don't need that anymore. We've got time here. So what we need to do is we need to get get rid of cycle. So we need to have a cycle on top. Cycle here. And instruction on the bottom. In order to make this work mathematically. Well, do we have a measure of how many clock cycles it takes for a single instruction to execute. Well, see now, here's the difference. I've actually talked with a paradigm in the way I've talked about it that says all instructions take the same amount of time. I've made that assumption as I'm talking, but that's not necessarily true. And we'll talk, and so then I want, so I want to talk about that just a little bit. Okay, so Here's our two categories. So I've kind of defined this out. So what'll, what will what will happen, right? Is we're gonna, we're gonna cross that out and that out. And we can cross off the units, right? And so then we get time per program. All that. All right. That's good. All right. So here's our two styles. Risk. This is reduced. instruction set computer uh, and oops here's the alternate so he, here's the thing that's interesting is they didn't come about risk first they came upon sisk Sisk is complex. So remember, inside of that CPU, there's a control unit. There's an ALU and a control unit. So that control unit is the thing that's going to decode your, your instruction and decide which piece of software or which piece of hardware or how things will be done. So in a CISC system, what we can do is we can have things that are more intense or they take more cycles. We don't guarantee that cycle. <clears throat> so we don't guarantee that we have one clock cycle per instruction, right? So which means we can have some things that are more complex, which in some ways is really nice, right? Because it makes it easier to read. But in other cases, it's kind of, it's not good because it means, well, we think about this is that in a pipelining situation, and we've talked about pipelining a little bit, right? In a pipelining situation, we're doing a decode and then also we're doing a fetch, right? So we do a fetch and a decode and both of those are quick. But then we've got to execute it, right? But sometimes we have to go to memory. Sometimes we don't. All kinds of different um, strategies. Well, we can go out to get the thing from memory. But what happens is in that pipelining is that if instructions are at the same speed, all the cycles are the are every instruction it takes the same number of cycles, and that was B1 then we know we can execute at the same speed that we can fetch, that we can decode relatively and roughly, right? It's all going to be about the same. So we can sync up everything that allows us to pipeline more easily. 
In a complex system, that's not true at all. But maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. So let me talk about a real simple example. Let's take two numbers and multiply them together. 4 times 3. Simple. Okay. In a CISC or complex instruction set computer, what we'll do is we'll we're going to say load four. I'm going to stick that into the basically the accumulator, and and both of these have an accumulator, but they have different uh, registers. They're going to have different registers based on different criteria. So we're going to load the four, and then we're probably going to stash that into an uh, into a register. And so I'm not going to put that here, but it, it's another thing that we need to do. We'll need to do that for both of them. And then we're going to load the three. And then what we can do is we can do a multiply. So let's, let's assume that we're going to go, you know, register A. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. I'm going to do it like this. And so then here we say multiply A and B. That looks simple. Okay, good. So here in a risk, we're going to do something different. We're going to load the 4 into A, then we're going to load the 3 into B, so nothing different there. Oh, actually, let me back that up and do it a little differently here. I'm going to load this into B and this into C. Okay, so then what we're going to do is I'm going to put a, a note here. I'm going to call this begin. That's the beginning of the loop. So then we add B and C and then store I'm oh, sorry, not that, not to be into C, sorry. We're going to add A and B. We probably need to go up here and go uh, clear, clear A. Sort of set, or, or actually, Although there's probably a special command to do this, but maybe not. Load zero into A. Okay, so I load zero into A, then I load four into B and three into C. I've got these three registers that I can use, let's say. So then what I do, so I add A and B together, then I store that back into A And then I then what I need to do is I need to subtract one from three. Now you can't do that, right? But we're just going to uh, in a risk you probably couldn't do subtraction either because I've talked about this, right? We're going to do it a little differently, but let's assume that we can. Subtraction, 3 minus 1, which is a constant, right? And then we're going to store that back into A. Not into A, sorry, back into C. 
and I need to erase this three. It's not three there, it's C. Okay, then jump to begin. And we're not going to put all the technicalities in here because there's going to be some more technicalities. Uh, unless, uh, I'll just say, unless C equals, I'll put two equal signs to signify that for the Java users. Uh, for non-Java users, uh, understand that we're looking at, or actually C family users, uh, we're looking at equality. We're making sure that this is equal. Not We're not making the assignment. Okay. So, and maybe this one, right, we might put another one here that is store A. Take that value to store it back into A. Okay. Now, here's where the problem comes in. Not, well, not necessarily a problem. The problem is, is this guy right here. The rest of these are all fast. Multiplication's not fast. In fact, we talked about how we could potentially use peasant's math or bit shifting in order to actually solve it. I think that was even a, a, a question on the last exam. Yeah, I think it was. So, the problem comes in this multiplication. Because multiplication is not that simple. If I just want to multiply, it's going to take more time to do that multiplication. Even if I use bit shifting, right? Because I have to figure out how many ones there are in, in one of them. And then I have to start shifting and doing adding as I go. And so here's the interesting thing. Um, we actually know that uh, in an eight, in 808, process or 808 chip and and that's the very first chip that Intel made it requires multiplication of two 16-bit integers We know exactly how long that takes. It takes 133 clock cycles. That's a lot. We say, well, that's the very first chip. That was way back in the 70s. Who do we, why do we care now, right? Computers are so much faster now. And yes, you're right. But what's faster? The clock cycle is faster. We go back up here. The number amount of time per cycle has, has increased. The number of cycles per instruction is the same, and the number of instructions per program is the same. So although we might be able to decrease that a little bit using algorithm, which is what, what, what you could potentially do. We might be able to get down to 100 or maybe 120, or maybe even we could squeeze it down really good and get it down to, say, 35, maybe. Depends. I don't know. There are people who actually spend weeks and weeks and years and months actually trying to decrease the number of cycles per instruction. Okay. Okay. In a risk processor, we don't have to worry about that because we just don't, we don't have the, because the programmer themselves will take care of the problem for us. 
The programmer themselves gets to tailor what they're doing to the way the chipset works, and they get to change the assembly language on the base level to what's going on. So, uh, but in a complex instruction set, we have to make those decisions ourselves instead of passing it off to the programmer. Well, and you'd think, well, we're smarter about it, right? Well, and although there are people out there who are very smart about it, the, the problem is, and this is actually, this is an interesting thing, is that no one is smarter than everyone. That's actually a value, and not everyone will agree with me on that. Completely okay with that. What I mean by that is, is that the collective knowledge of all programmers, or, let me back up, the collective knowledge of a single programmer is less than the accumulated knowledge of all programmers who are allowed to communicate with each other. Since the good news is, we as programmers can communicate with each other, and in fact, actually, one of the points of a four-year degree, and part of the reason why they require it for most programming jobs, is because you need to be able to talk to other programmers. So being able to communicate with other programmers, what it does is, it means your skill set, what you know, can be added to what they know, or more importantly, what they know can be added to what you know. I know I'm kind of talking something kind of big here, but what this means is, in a complex system, I'm going to hardwire how it gets done into the chip itself. In a risk system, I'm going to say, I don't know the best way to do it, and so I'm going to let the programmer do it themselves. And then I might have a good way to do it. But someone else might be able to improve on my way or come up with a whole new different way to do things. And if they do, then they can share that with the world if they want. It's up to them. And, but when they do, that improves everyone, not just me, not just you. Improves everyone. And we don't have to go back and redesign the stinking chip, which is a good thing, because chips are hard to design, very difficult to design. Okay. So hopefully kind of everyone's understanding this a little bit at, at a real basic level, the difference between CISC and RISC. They never even conceived of risk until the 70s, which if you remember back to the history of computing, that's pretty late in the game, right? Because they started having integrated circuits and computers that could do stuff in, 19, in, the, in the mid 40s. Well, geez, that's, that's thir almost 30 years later. Of course, we're farther removed from 1972 when they first came up with risk. Nowadays, most processors are RISC. Not all. There's still a few holdouts, I believe. Now, I haven't done all the research, so I don't know. But, but um, if they've made that change in the last few years since I looked up the documentation I looked at. Okay. All right. Um, oh, what I want to do, actually, is I want to bring up... Uh, a graphic that I found. No, I want to. Come on. Play my hand. There we go. Bring this. Ooh, what happened there? That's not what I wanted to do. Yeah, okay, undo that. Okay, come over here. Come on. I'm gonna put this there. There we go. And can we get it over here? Okay, we can. Okay, good. Now, can I grab it? That and. Well. can grab that. Yeah, because I want to make this a little bit bigger. Oh, that doesn't help. Alright, well, I guess. Whatever. 
Okay. Oh, that's not too hard to read for you guys. It's just a lot of extra space. All right. So actually, these are flipped. I should have done it the other way, especially since I knew this. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. This wasn't until... It, it, it was first conceived in the 70s, I think 72. I was reading somewhere at some point that 72 was the number. Um, put that in parentheses here, 1972. But the problem was is they didn't. none of those computers actually came out onto the market. So it comes out onto the market in the 80s, in the early 80s. So this can take... And up to 100 or 133, that's what document we document. We know multiplication takes that long on that first uh, first processor or the first transistor. It brings us into a modern era. <clears throat> so what CISC does is it says the instruction um, does as much as possible on the hardware. So it's going to try to do complex things on the hardware but on the software side, right, or a higher, um, so in a lot of ways in RISC, we actually pass it off to the compiler to do this or to the programmer. So when I said programmer, I might just mean the person who creates the compiler that turns it from Python code. A compiler we can use synonymously here with interpreter <coughs> from, uh, in this context at least, it's gonna, they're going to turn it from that high-level language like Python or Java, and they're going to turn that into assembly code, so it can be run, which can then be turned into machine code, which can be then run on the machine. So, uh, yeah, this is one of the big ones here, though. Okay, so we pass the burden off to someone else, and part of the thing that makes that really useful, right, is that those things can be in, made better. Because it's just an algorithm. And I think for a lot of you, there'll be a study of algorithms. Um, and when I teach that class, I really like looking at sorting algorithms because it's a really great way to do it. Um, but uh, there's still, th so you might think, well, geez, they've, they've, they've figured it all out. Well, that might be true, but there was, a, uh, there's the, the fastest sort most people would agree with. Uh, and in most circumstances, it's correct. It's called something called quick sort. Uh, quick sort, <clears throat> they thought it was as good as possible. And we always think we're as smart as and good as we possibly, uh, as, as is possible. We know as much about things as possibly can be known. This is not true. And we prove ourselves wrong every single year. A grad student doesn't even have a doctorate, which is another thing to import, another important lesson, but that's a, a lesson that doesn't have anything to do with this. A grad student in India about 10 years ago, maybe now, came up with a new way to do quick sort that made it effectively 10 to 15 percent faster. Maybe it was even faster than that, but it, he made it significantly faster. It was a huge breakthrough, uh, and it just goes to tell you that you never know. You just never know when somebody will come up with that idea that will make it things better. And so that's that's where risk actually can be really useful. Um, but I shouldn't I shouldn't throw CISC out completely. Okay, right because this next one here in CISC because. The RAM usage is it's only going to use RAM between instructions. So it doesn't have to use RAM as hard. And so, but in RISC, it does use RAM more. And it requires more RAM to be able to get things to work a lot of times. All right. Complex and variable length instructions. Simple standardized instructions. So all instructions take the exact same amount of time. Only one layer of instructions, and that this supports um, uh, yeah, so it, it supports something called microcode. This actually isn't necessarily one is better than the other. So this is a large number of instructions. Uh, and, and we when I mean large, we mean maybe a thousand. 
Um, small number of instructions. The one I'm familiar with is MIPS, and I think in MIPS there's only 32. It's either 32 or 64. Um, so let me look that up quick. Oh, let me get my let me get my microphone out here so I can see it a little better. Or maybe you guys can hear. You should be able to hear pretty good, anyways. This microphone's really nice. Um, so let's look at the instruction set for MIPS here. Let me bring that over here. This is according to the University of Pacific. No idea where they are, but we'll figure it out. So this is a partial list. MIPS 32. I'm guessing that has 32 instructions. <laughs> And uh, it's looking like, uh, this is just talking about, uh, oh no, that's how many registers it, it has. Okay. Does it say? Uh, it doesn't say, so let uh, MIPS instructions, set. Oh, that's the one I just looked at. That's the same exact thing. Yeah. Now here's one from Berkeley. A few special notes. Uh, so right here are the instructions. Let me just look thirty or forty three. So that's in that's in hex code though. I bet well. No, because there aren't any letters in here. So we're looking at 43. So maybe, I think it goes to 64, because I, there's no reason not to go to 64. So that's my guess is that's what it is, 64. Um, which means it wouldn't take super long and you'd have them all memorized. You might not have all of the uses exactly, some of the less used ones, but there is no way in a CISC uh, processor you could ever do that. Uh, right, and then some of your addressing modes, they're going to be a little different as well, potentially. And some of that has to do with, uh, well, you don't need as many addressing modes in RISC because just like we you know, we looked at in some of the other chapters when we were looking at, you know, how things get moved from RAM into cache, the thing is, in RISC, there are fewer, uh, there are fewer bits used for the opcode as opposed to risk, which means that we have more bits available for memory, so we can have larger amounts of memory without increasing the size of our throughput, or the, sorry, not throughput, the size of our, um, our, our total instruction. So if we say our instructions are limited to 16 bits, then, and we only have 64, and 64 would be six, so we'd need six bits for the opcode, so then we would have the rest of 10, which would give us about, well, give us 1,024 addresses. That's about, that's not a lot. Um, so we probably 16 isn't big enough. We might need to go to, say, a 32 to really, you know, make it good. So, all right, that's a little bit about RISC versus CISC. Um, and there's more details. There's plenty more details here um, to, to, to f potentially flesh out what the heck is going on here that was weird definitely weird alright I want to draw a line here Okay, so also part of the, the architecture is, is how many processors we have and how many different ways we have of accessing our RAM or our cache or our memory in any way. So what I'm going to do is I want to talk about Flynn's taxonomy. Let me 
actually. I want to get the definition for taxonomy. Because although I prepared for the thing here, I, I, I still want to look at this. So taxonomy, a branch of science concerned with classification, especially of organisms and systematics, not what we're using. Classification of something. So what we're going to do is we're going to classify some things. That's what taxonomy means, is to classify a system of classification. So in Flynn's taxonomy, and we'll, we'll, I'll talk about how it works, um, and I'll show you the original way he did things, and then we're going to expand on them a little bit. So can I insert a table? Ah, yes, good. I think I need a three by three table, except I want this to be bigger. No, 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 none of that stuff actually is what I want to do. Hmm. Can I grab that, move it down here a little bit, make it bigger? Well, that doesn't help at all. Well, maybe I start putting. Eh. All right, let's just do a hand drawn one instead. Okay. I thought it maybe it would be neat to do this. Okay, so first off, so there's two things. One is the instruction stream. Instruction, oops, stream. What this means is, the easiest way to kind of think about it is, can we do things in parallel or not? So one is single, the other one is multiple. So can we do things in parallel? So we say here single, the other one is multiple. Right, parallel meaning at the same time. So, right, we create these two streams of data. So extreme is one after another, instructions, sorry, stream of instructions. Stream is one after the other. Okay, and then over here, we have data streams. So what this is here is, so, okay. So just because something, the instruction streams can be in multiple s sets, doesn't mean we have multiple processors to work on them. So and that's one way to kind of think about data streams is here, is, right, we can have single and multiple. So we do the same thing, single and multiple. Okay, I'm going to draw this lines like this. Kind of get that split there. All right, so we have S single instruction, single data. We have multiple instructions, single data, single instruction multiple data and boy you guessed it M I M D multiple instructions multiple data okay let me I'll talk about a little bit on an example of each So this is what we would call a uniprocessor, right? So it just says one processor. So uniprocessor.
Okay, so under this one, so this one is interesting. So this has a single point of control, uh, and it executes at the same time, but it does the same thing to everything. So if you've learned about streams in Python, that uh, it's similar. It's a different level, though, right? Because we're talking about instruction sets and instructions. Um, so this this would be the same instruction. instruction on multiple values. All right, so this one here, uh, yep, so uh, multiple instructions, single data stream. So again, we only have one processor. But what we're going to do is we're going to do multiple things to each data point as it comes through the processor. So, I don't, I, I'm trying to think of a, a good way to, these, this is really kind of a rare spot, because we might, we might take an array that, that we get in, and we might sort, sort it forwards and backwards, and an alternate sorting style, and, or, right, different ways to sort something, right? But we would do them all at the same time. Okay. So multi instructions on the same data set. It also means at the same time. All right, now, this last one, um, this is the multiprocessor. Not at the same time. Oh, uh, hopefully I didn't lose connection there. I, I got a, um, just got a message that the connection was reestablished. So, All right, here, well, we'll see um, if that, that was the case or not. Um, hope, hopefully, uh, you guys didn't drop too long. Uh, so the, the multiprocessor, right, that's where you've got things where you can do doing one thing on one processor and another thing on another processor. Or we, can, you know, or we can do divide and conquer kind of things. There's a lot of different styles that we can do. Okay, but here's the part that gets cool. All right, so now we can split this one into two different things so that we can have shared memory or distributed memory. So shared memory would mean that the same RAM, the same cache, is used by all the different processors. Distributed memory says that each processor gets its own memory. Now, there is kind of an in-between, there's more of a continuum here than one or the other, because sometimes multiple processors share the same memory, but it's still considered distributed because there's different memory centers that different processors are connected to.
What is my notes? I wrote something in my notes, and now I don't know what this is. Oh, okay. All right, so here, ah, we can split this up, and this is going to reflect this. So this is, so MPP, so massively parallel processors. So we're just going to have a lot of different processors, and we're going to be able to, uh, to work on this to, at the same time. So there's a, uh, a few out there. I don't even know if they all exist anymore. Well, in the old days when we used to have screensavers, although we don't anymore because now things just go to sleep, uh, there, were, there was one uh, called the SETI project. It's actually really a neat, neat thing. And maybe go out and look at it. So what, what it did, there was some number crunching as it talked about image processing. And so what you did is you signed up your computer. So when your computer was idle, when you weren't using it, then uh, SETI had a program that would load on there and be able to use your computer uh, for some of its number crunching. Uh, I, I don't think that's still out there, but it could be. It could be. You guys will have to check. Uh, and Oh, the other one is, is a distributed system. So when I say that, we could actually hook up a bunch of computers. Actually, this is super cool if you ever see it working. Uh, is that you can hook up a bunch of computers that will work on the same problem at the same time. And that's similar to what I was talking about with that SETI. So, uh, it's pretty pretty neat. Uh, how does this differ? So, the di oh, actually SETI goes under distributed system. The massively parallel processors would mean that we just have a lot of processors on, my, on our computer. When we say massive, we can get to a lot, a huge number. Now, this is where this all breaks down because there's another category. that We've got four here, right? Taxonomy, great, we're perfect. Well, there's one more, SPMD. Single program, multiple data. What that means is, um, so it has a bunch of microprocessors. Each one has its own data set and program memory. And then the same the same program is executed on all of them at the same time. These are really supercomputers. If you ever are a person who is in a position to buy a supercomputer, and I'm not talking about the new greatest gaming machine out there, right? I'm talking about an actual true supercomputer. If you're ever in that position, please remember your your professor for computer organization and architecture, um, and and get a hold of me, and, and maybe you know maybe help me out or something like that, right? If you're ever in a position, because those these things cost an awful lot of money. So, but if you're ever in your in a position to do that, that would be great to know about it. <clears throat> All right. Ah, okay. So these bottom two, um, these would be called parallel here, parallel programming. So the, these two here are going to be parallel processors. Oh, no, actually, no, they're not. Never, but they are, but that's what we'll talk about next time. Because I think we're not out of time, but we're out of material. I could have talked about all kinds of different vocabulary words and uh, do, 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 uh, like a cluster or a pile of computers or you know how cluster computing works. But all of those things are things you guys can le learn on your own. Uh, we won't be 
uh, covering them anymore here. But Flynn's taxotomy and the difference between risk and CISC and kind of the thoughts behind both of them. All right. Uh, unless, unless somebody has a question in the, the chat here, we're going to go ahead and close it out for the day. And I, I know um, it's not a great way to do things, maybe, but... Um, so I'm going to end the lecture now, and I'm actually going to talk about something else that you guys might have a care about. Um, recently, um, I read a paper, uh, or I read part of it. I skimmed over a paper. I haven't read the whole thing yet. Uh, talking about a CS1 course that was done online. Now it's, and this is in University of California, Riverside. And they're actually quite good at doing online courses. <clears throat> and I would love to, uh, well, I don't know. Can we distribute that? I think I probably can. <clears throat> if you're interested in how they do their course, uh, I'll be happy to share that with you. And it talks about the development of that course as well. And uh, if you're interested in that, let me know. I can certainly email that paper to you. But one of the things that I thought was really neat, and I realized I'm not doing it in this course. Of course, they're, they started out asynchronous. They didn't like it, and they switched to synchronous. So uh, be aware that, um, you know, if you can... Uh, at all get synchronous courses it's probably better for you to do that whether that's face to face or online the interesting part is the outcomes that they got because they give the same exact test to both groups both in class and synchronous online and the grades were about the same which means people were learning about the same amount in both courses also, but people also really enjoyed the online version of it because it allowed them easier time to ask questions and uh, and, and interact and actually do the work. Now, one of the problems with this course is so much of it is theory it, and there isn't as much coding involved, so it's a little harder to kind of... Um, we've only had a very little bit of doing any kind of code. Um, and I know that's disconcerting for a lot of people, but that's just kind of how it is. Uh, and there's there's probably three or four courses in the curriculum that are like that. So one of them is this course. Um, another one is uh, Theory of Computation, that one. Although you, you do get to write programs, but you don't write them in the same way. So I happen to really have loved that class, but you write them in a different way. Uh, and then uh, the networking course a lot of times is, is a lot of theory as well, although there is some um, exploration of actual hard hard stuff. And so and we'll and we're gonna have we're gonna have our part as well, right, when we do our do some assembly code that kind of shows you some of the differences. Now, what we are using is a risk processor or risk uh, computing, right? So we have a, a reduced instruction set. In fact, it's very reduced. So maybe it's a V-R-I-S-C, although I don't think that's a category. Um, and, and that will allow us uh, to, to get a little bit of practice on, on some of this. Uh, but but it was it's very interesting uh, kind of how they did that course. And so it, there's a possibility I'm, I'm going to be uh, teaching a CS1 or a CS2, and I'd love to in implement some of their different strategies. So, uh, but that's, I guess that's all I've got for tonight. And uh, I'm going to, I'm going to log off here. I, I need to head to the store, um, but I will be back. And before I, I go to sleep tonight, I will have your assignment seven graded. So, all right. Take care. I will see you. Uh, well, I'll I'll be online tomorrow night, and we'll be finishing. Uh, well, I don't know if we'll be finishing, but we'll certainly working on some more out of uh, architecture. We're going to talk about parallel uh, parallel architectures and multiprocessor processor architectures, and kind of how that plays out. Okay, that's all I've got for today, and I will talk to you all later.